So uh, just a quick welcome to Lee. How are you, Lee? Thanks for making this happen, mate. No worries. Yeah, no worries at all, guys. I'm, I'm glad you could join me. Um, obviously, we just finished the shootout. Didn't go, uh, didn't go exactly to plan, but um, we were the fastest yesterday, but we just missed the tyre pressures for the run. So starting P6, um, yeah, not a bad place to start the race. So uh, the weather's probably going to play a little bit of a part tomorrow. But uh, yeah, we've, we've got a... Uh, I've got a great co-driver in Michael Caruso, so I think, um, and we got a speedy car, which is which goes a long way around here. Yeah, um, something does. Yeah, so I, I'm pumped. I think you know, even starting P6, we can win it from there. So um, we have got all the ingredients for a good result. Yeah, so, uh, I thought I, you're going to be dealing with as well. Starting position is probably not as key as what it is uh, when it's a fully dry race. Yeah, it's it's a bit hard to know what to do is set up for tomorrow because until we know what the weather's going to do um you know if it's going to dry out at the end of the race you want to set the car up as a as a dry race car but um so to be fast at the end of the race you you, you know in the in the dry you need the car to be a little bit loose so it might not be that quick in the wet if we do that but um if you set it up as a as a wet car which means you soften it off take a bit of camber off um you soften the bars soften the springs uh it makes said a really quick car in the wet but not so great when it dries out so um you've got a you can compromise or you can or you can bank on uh, on it being dry at the end of the race and and just sort of having to put up with a, a pretty ordinary car in the wet so that'll be our uh decision that we have to make tomorrow when we know it's going to go on with the weather and there's a few people who have asked about Is that something... with regards to the setup that you might be uh practicing with through the weekend have you been practicing uh, much of a wet setup, or has it just been pretty much the dry? Pretty setup? much, you just wait until it's wet, and then you see what you got. So we haven't had a wet session yet. We've just purely been setting it up as a as a one lap car so far, and um, and we did that fairly successfully up until the shootout. So, um, but today we made a few changes just to see what tools we got in the bank for um, just you you try and detune it a little bit for the for the race because you need a car that's comfortable, um, a car that's predictable. Whereas as a qualifying car, a one lap car, you need it very pointy. You, you want the rear sliding a fair bit on entry just to get you pointed into the corner. Um, and uh, yeah, so they don't mind it sliding around a bit uh, while you've got good tires. But if you're doing that on a, um, throughout a race run, um, you overheat the tires and, uh, and it really kills your, your, your tire life and, um, and pace. So yeah, that's the plan for tomorrow. Um, We'll just use the morning session, the warm-up, uh, to, to see what it's like on a full tank. Um, and then, yeah, I think we're in the ballpark with it anyway. We just um, There's a, a little tweak we can do just by um, lowering the rear ride height, which gives you back a bit of, uh, bit of rear grip, and that's probably all we need for the race. So we're not far away. Um, I'm just yeah. walking up to the car now. I was just on that, guys. Uh, for those who have driven at Bathurst, you know how close the walls are and everything, and... Lee wants the car to be sliding around. He wants the back to be moving around. And if you can imagine how close all those balls are, it's a fairly committed driver who's asking for that, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. If you're, if you're not using every millimetre of this track, you're, you're going to be off the pace. So, um, but you need a, a car that's, that you know exactly what it's going to do underneath you. Um, or else, see you, buddy. Um, or else, you know, it can turn pretty ugly very quickly. Because if the car slides, you know, a foot more than you want it to on exit, well, you're in the fence pretty hard. So, um, yeah, you got to know what, what's underneath you. Have a heap of confidence and um, and push it to the absolute nth degree. So uh, we um, we've done, yeah, we've done a good job with that so far. And Michael's been fast, my co-driver. Uh, we've teamed up before in 09, got a podium. Um, so uh, it's great to be back with him and. He's similar height to me, so it makes um, makes the driver changes fairly easy and fairly quick because we don't have to put a seat insert in. Um, we'll probably be changing drivers about three times or four times tomorrow. Um, and uh, but the good thing is he's fast enough to be able to run up against some of the main guys. So we're at a bit of an advantage, but there's a whole heap of guys up and down this pit lane with really good co-drivers. So um, anyway, we'll see how we go. I think. Um, Probably will start with Michael, and then uh, and you try and get the co-driver stints out nice and early so that we can come home, put me in the car 
for a, a triple stint home, which means uh, it's about um, the co-driver has to do 54 laps all up. So uh, that, that leaves the rest to me out of 161 laps. So um, they're not allowed in for, uh, for longer than uh, actually shouldn't have started on that because I don't know the answer to that but I know there's a, there's a time limit for how long they can stay in the car so they can't just do 54 laps and then jump out and I go through to the end um, usually you, you jump they'll put the co-driver you'll put the main driver in with about um, uh, at about the 90 90 lap mark or 95 lap mark and I'll run through to the end from there it's a pretty long stint it's about two and a half hours if someone actually asked about the stints and how you deal with the um, the actual, uh, you know, managing the physical side of that. So, um, is it very different running that many laps in a row around a track like Bathurst, or is it not so bad because you've got a couple of long tracks where you can sort of relax a little bit? Sorry, I didn't quite hear all that, Dino. Um, yeah, there was a couple of a question about the physical side of dealing with such long stints and uh, do you do any specific training for it or how's it all work in that regard? If someone actually asked about the stints and how you deal with the, um, the actual, uh, you know, managing the physical side of that. So um, is it very different running that many laps in a row around a track like Bathurst or is it not so bad because you've got a couple of long tracks where you can sort of relax a little bit? Sorry, I didn't quite hear all that, Dino. Um, yeah, there was a couple of a question about the physical side of dealing with such long stints and uh, do you do any specific training for it or how's it all work in that regard? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, well, because we've been on the road so much, um, we haven't really had to do as much training as we, as we usually would if we're back in Melbourne. Um, you know, you've got all your gym and everything like that. Uh, ready to go and you, you're in a bit of a routine but since we've been away we've been um, on the road now for 105 days I think it is away from Melbourne um, you guys are probably a lot of you are jealous the ones that are down here in Melbourne that you that you're uh, you're in lockdown and you can't do the same um, but uh, yeah so we've been keeping pretty race fit but doing a lot during the week as well running riding um, you know, weights at the gym, that sort of thing. So we do a fair bit for it. Um, you need a lot of stamina in these cars, especially for this event here. You, your heart rate's high for, for a very long time, a, a very long period. Um, you need the strength to be able to put up with the, uh, the forces that go through the car in your neck, um, the G-forces, the, uh, and then obviously wheeling the thing with your arms. You need a lot of upper body strength. Um, you need, need very good... Uh, leg strength as well because you're pressing on the brake about uh, 90 to 100 kilograms every stop. Um, so do a lot of uh, squats and you know um, leg weights. So, uh, but yeah, there's there's plenty we have to do to to keep fit for these cars. That's for sure. We do have a cool suit in the car, which I'll show you in a minute, um, which does keep you cool. But in the cabin, it's usually about 25 degrees hotter inside the car than it is ambient temperature outside uh, so you know at the hottest race of the year which is usually Adelaide or Newcastle um, where it's probably about 35 degrees um, sometimes we get 40 degrees in Adelaide which means that it tips the car up to about 65 degrees um, inside the cabin we have we, we need our cool suit if that fails we're, we're not going to make it through the end because you'll just simply overheat your body temple just overheat so um, very important to keep that going, but as it is tomorrow, I think we're probably at around the 20 degree mark, which means in the car it's a, a comfy 45 degrees. So um, yeah, it's not not too bad. That's pretty good for us. <laughs> and did you want to show us the car I'll, now? Is it a good time to have a look at? Yeah, the car? so I'll I'll take you over. I might find it hard to answer any questions, so I'll just give you a, a bit of a um, a run around the car and explain a few things. They've got yeah, the. Okay. Uh, the airbox at the, off at the moment. I'll give my screen a bit of a wipe. Looks a bit, um, a bit dirty. Oh, that's better. <laughs> um, so you see the shiny trumpets there. Um, they're just having a look over everything, making sure that it, she's all good to go tomorrow. Uh, we get about 5,000 kilometres out of these engines. They're a five-litre engine. They put out about, Sid, how much horsepower? 
640, 640 horsepower. Um, so, and they're a very expensive thing. So um, we uh, we try to put a fresh one in for this round because obviously we're doing a thousand k in the race, and then in the lead up you're uh, you're running probably about another 400 k on it. Um, so yeah, you want to make sure it's fresh. Um, and and Sid will be going over everything tonight to make sure that there's nothing bent in there or nothing uh, that, that's going to fail for tomorrow. Um, so. See there, Caruso Holsworth. Caruso is my teammate. Um, they've pulled out a lot of the suspension parts at the moment because they're just checking him over. Um, in the back here, obviously it looks a fair bit different in the boot to what a road car is or, or what most race cars are, where the fuel um, the fuel tank is under here. Um, they put it as far forward as, you, as they can go in this car to give you a bigger crumple zone here so that it doesn't explode on a, on a rearward impact. impact. Um, this is, this usually, this comes off for the, uh, for the fuel um, and you've got a, a fuel in and a fuel out hole, um, which leads into these, these pipes here. Um, so fuel in and, and the air coming out obviously helps it, uh, helps the, the, uh, the feed come in quite quickly, but, with the fuel itself, the fuel churn, um, they're up here and it's gravity fed. So we don't, we can't pressurize these systems. So um, everyone's pretty much got the same flow rate. It's about um, three liters per second, roughly. So in the stop will be, uh, we've got a 112 liter tank. Uh, and I think if my calculations are right, I think it takes around 25, 26 seconds to fill up the tank. So, um, uh, don't don't quite me on that, <laughs> but uh, yeah, here's the, the front suspension. So you got the big rotors there, massive, massive rotors. Uh, we have to change them throughout the race as well. It's compulsory because uh, as the as the rotors get up to um, a certain life, uh, they start wearing out these little grooves in the rotor, um, these little hooks, and uh, and once that sort of wears out, um, you you start losing the retardation in the brake. So we, we change them probably, I think the requirement is that you have to change them before about lap, uh, lap 90 or 70, somewhere around there. Um, and that'll give you a strong brake package um, from mid race onwards. In the car, got these big Mustang doors, they're huge. Um, so we've got a bit of padding in there from, uh, I we'll have to run that because Caruso is shorter than me. <laughs> um, he's probably about Dean's size, actually. <laughs> uh, you got the steering wheel here. Uh, you got the dash up here, which usually lights up with a whole heap of information. Um, that'll tell us our roll bar positions, which are these things here. So we can stiffen up the roll bars, um, the sway bars throughout the race, uh, throughout throughout a lap. Actually, you can tune them up. Um, that'll change the balance of the car. If you go stiffer in the rear, it usually will make the rear of the car slide more. Um, if you go stiffer in the front, it'll make the, um, the it'll, it'll give you a bit of understeer. Um, and, uh, but you usually run them quite high when the tires are a very good quality. As the tires uh, go away um, and lose performance, you soften them off to let the car use its suspension a little bit more than, and be a bit kinder on the tire itself. Uh, so also on the on the steering wheel, you got a, a start button. So down here, we've got a number of others. Sorry if it's a bit dark. I might see if I can turn the light on there. So um, not that, that didn't work. Sorry. Um, coming down. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So there's a number of uh, buttons there, which are just for the cool suit and demister and oil tank, all sorts of stuff. Um, but the ignition, you got the main switch up here. Ignition switch there. As soon as that's on, you can put buttons. That's the that's to kick it over. Um, you got an, uh, a button here which scrolls through different race pages. Um, a uh, an alarm button, uh, a brake line pressure button, which we use on the start. So when, when you push the brake in on the start, you then you you hold the brake down, push this button, then you can come off the brake. So then it acts as a handbrake. So you can load the clutch up and not and not creep on the start so that'll just uh 
that'll make sure that you're, you're really quick in reaction time when the lights go out. Drink button, um, the drink feeds into our helmet. We've got a straw in the helmet. Um, it all hooks up to this thing here. Um, that runs into a camel back on the back of the seat. Um, usually we would have a cool box in here, uh, which is, we call it an esky because we put dry ice and water in it. Um, and that, um, there's a tunnel that runs through that cools down the air that sucks into the car from the window and then it runs into this helmet fan which plugs into the top of our helmet and uh, gives us a little bit of cool air. Um, it also has, with the water that runs through that esky, uh, it feeds into a, 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 a water vest that we wear as well. It's got water veins running through it um, and that runs through at about 10 degrees. So we do get some cooling in there. If we didn't have that, then we'd be in big trouble. Got the shift lights up here. They also act as lock lights. So when you lock an inside front, um, it'll it'll come up here as a little white light. So you might see in car, you'll see um, some some lights flashing sometimes when someone turns into a corner, and that's when their uh, their inside front is is uh, is basically on the verge of a lock. So you can get onto the uh, onto the you release a bit of brake pressure just to make sure that it unlocks. Um, window net here, so we have to do that up before the, uh, the, the driver that jumps in before he drives away. Um, you'll see these lights here. One of them uh, is for the, for the co-driver, so when the co-driver's in the car, you'll see a green light on. Um, the other one is actually an old light that used to be for when we were on a, on a different tyre. Well, we actually do run that. When we're on soft, it goes, we push the, uh, a light that flashes, uh, that, that lights that up as orange, and then people know what tyre you're on. Um, those lights are also at the front of the car as well, so when you look in from the windscreen, you can see it as well on, uh, on this side of the car. You'll see. Um, the big splitter on the front, grabs the whole heap of air and pushes down on the front. So that gives us a bit of downforce. Um, in qualifying in the shootout, we blank up the, the, the air intake here to, to trap more air and push down to give you more downforce. So seeing the shootout and also these brake ducts here are, are nearly, nearly blanked out completely just to trap more air and give us more downforce. Um, the same with the rear, um, with the rear wing. Massive Mustang rear wing. Um, you can change the angle on it with these little holes here. Um, we are running very, very little wing just to get, because this is such an aero track, you need good straight line speed. So um, we run very little wing, but it's a bit of a balancing act because if you go too far, you don't have any rear grip going up over the top and makes it very hairy. So uh, we uh, obviously more rear wing angle, the more downforce, the more rear grip that you get. <coughs> um, in the stops, when we pull up, you'll see uh, the guys plug a, what they call a spike. They push that into that little hole in there. Um, that's hooked up to the air bottles over there, you can see. Um, so when the car stops in pit lane, they push the spike in. That pushes that right there. You can hardly see it. Um, there's a inbuilt jacks on each corner of the car. So when the line pressure from that jack, from the spike goes into the car, it pushes the jack out from in here, comes out under here. So that, that's actually up on a double jack stand at the moment. But this little uh, thin one that comes down, that's the one that comes down, pushes the car up, and uh, the boys get on the wheel very quickly. There's the spike there. So he's our spike man, actually. <laughs> He also helps me with um, getting in the car, helping with the belts uh, from the other side once he's jacked the car up. Um, the engineers all sit over here with all these screens. There's my wife and my daughter, Alana and Ava. <laughs> they're, here for a, they're here for a bit of food tonight. I'm trying to get there. Um, but they up here on all the screens. Um, usually you would see all squiggly lines and everything that the engineers are looking at throughout the the session and, uh, and they can tune the car up um, based on our feedback and then they confirm with the data on the screen. There's my engineer, Sammy. Oh, here we go, here's some squiggly lines up here. So you got a ton of information in front of them. They got uh, 
What we got here? Cool suit, temperature, cabinet, temperature, cockpit, temperature, engine oil, engine temp. Yeah, there's a number of others. So I won't run you through them all, but um, and then along here, you got speed trace, um, revs, gear position. Uh, what we got here? Brake brake pressure along these little these little red ones. Um, steering angle, uh, and there's all these pressures. You know, all the coolant pressures and fuel pressures and all sorts of stuff there. So um, there's so much stuff that the guys go through. I'll just switch you back to me here. Um, yeah, so there's plenty of plenty that goes on behind the scenes here, and um, yeah, there's, that's why we've got 11 in each garage of two cars. So we've got a four car team. So there's 11 in in one garage, and then 11 in my garage. I share with James Courtney. Um, yeah, those guys are all always busy doing something. Um, in the, I'm just walking up to the, tr the truck where the engineers sit. So here's our engineering table. Um, this is the setup for every round. So, drive, there's, there's, this weekend there's eight drivers because the co-drivers, usually there's, there's only four of us. Um, and then there's, uh, there's another eight engineers. So, um, there's just so many people here, but uh, radios, all the radios for the team, everyone's got one. <laughs> and that system, all the radio system costs about half a million dollars. Uh, last, this isn't the most impressive part of the journey, but uh, I'm heading up into my A trailer, which is where the, we all get changed and it's not very impressive. And it stinks because everyone's race suits are all hanging up. Oh, there's Michael Caruso. Hello, G'day, Cruz. G'day, <laughs> mate. So, hang uh, up. Yeah, so that, that's about that's about it. Sorry, I took you to the least impressive part in the end. <laughs> You're making Anyone Michael got feel any? really good about himself there. <laughs> uh, has anyone got any anything they want to ask? I'll show you the the tyre tent, just to give you an idea of how many tyres we're running this weekend. We get 13 sets each car. So um, it's a hell of a lot. And that's not even including the wet tyres. So I'll turn the camera around again. Switch around. So got all these ones here. All of them, they're the wet ones. So they're not a great wet, but they're, uh, they've been around forever. Though the style of wet that, that we run but um you can see they got huge blocks so they don't actually disperse that much water so when we're on a when we're out there and it's pouring rain we're usually aquaplaning a fair bit and then and obviously for the uh for the dry we got the slick tires um yeah they, they're everywhere <laughs> i don't know how they keep up with them more but, uh, you just keep walking and finding more there's more in the garage too I think there's more back there, but uh, yeah, that's um, that's pretty much a wrap. Do you have any questions? Yeah, a couple of people sent some questions beforehand, uh, which are relevant to the talk you've just given there. So, uh, first of all, Gary asked, "What are three differences between the car you've been practicing in compared to the car you expect to race tomorrow?" Regardless of the wet weather, maybe just uh, is there much of a difference between what you've been just playing with in practice compared to what you would race tomorrow? Um, yeah, like, like I was saying before, we will we'll make sure we dial in a bit more. Um, good job, mate. There's the pole getter right there. Yeah, we can. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we will dial in a bit more rear grip for the race. Um, we don't want the car sliding. We want to be able to manage the the tyres and the um, the tyre temperatures, so we don't want it. Um, any sliding in the car is going to overheat the tyre. So, but like I said before, um, in qualifying, you can get away with it. You you make the car um, quite loose, which means you're uh, you've got a bit of oversteer on entry just to point the car, and then you can manage it with the throttle on the way out because the the tyre can put up with it for one lap. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much the difference. Pretty much, it's. it's um, I'd say the main difference would, would be that we soften up the rear a little bit. Have you been doing most of the um, qualifying work during your practice, and Michael's been doing the race runs, or have you also been doing some race runs? 
Um, I've I've done I've done one race one race run so far. Uh, Michael has really been helping me tune the car for qualifying as well. So we haven't done much race running. Um, <clears throat> it is quite easy to to detune the car for the race. Um, you don't want to detune it too much because at the end of the race or as the race goes on if it's a dry race <clears throat> more and more rubber goes down on the track and generally the more grippy the track the more rear grip you'll get rather than uh, it'll be <clears throat> it'll be biasing before um, uh, towards rear grip more so than front grip so um, you sort of need to start with a car that's got plenty of front grip but you don't want it oversteering at the same time with the roll bars um, you want to have plenty of range so that when the track's super fast at the end, um, you're pretty much doing qualifying lap after qualifying lap just to try and win the race. So you'll stiffen up that rear bar to the rear sliding a fair bit, um, <clears throat> probably soften off the front and um, and try and get your, your qualifying balance back um, during the race. And so there is a lot of focus towards that last bit of the race and the speed that you want to gain there rather than um, the start of the race where it's all just make sure you don't crash into someone at turn one sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. It's the, for the first probably, <coughs> sorry, guys, um, probably for the first two thirds of the race, it's pretty much a, just a survival race. I mean, it's, it's super quick, but you don't want to be doing anything stupid at that point, <clears throat> you know, throwing a desperate on someone, um, you don't want to be damaging the car. You just want the best car possible for the last, um, for the last, say, 40 laps, where you really start to <clears throat> push very, very hard, and um, that's when you start making the moves. You know, you you need to be there on the lead lap um, with fuel in hand over the guys in front. So you take. <clears throat> Sorry, I've got a, <laughs> I've got a uh, an itch in the back of my throat <clears> or <throat> a tickle. <laughs> um, that's, what happens when, that's what happens when you're talking to Victorians, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. I think I've caught it through the phone. <laughs> you're just Rise getting right. emotional. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, so what was I saying? Uh, yeah, so you'll try and take fuel um, every time you can in this race because the shorter you can make your fuel, your your pit stops at the end of the race, the more you can jump people. So you might see people jump, um, dropping back at the start of the race after they do a pit stop. And that's because they've taken on more fuel than someone else. So the, the engineers try to put you into a gap sometimes. <clears throat> I'm struggling here. <laughs> um, and uh, because you don't want to drop out behind a bunch of slow cars because it'll take you a hell of a long time to get through the pack. So uh, sometimes they won't fill the tank up and, um, and just to put you in the gap. So yeah, at the end, you just want everything up your sleeve to, to give it the best crack and have the shortest pit stop, <clears throat> take on the least amount of fuel. And that's why, you know, towards the end of the race, we'll be saving fuel um, because you just want a track position. It's very hard to pass once you, uh, if you're in front of someone, you can, you can give them a lot of aero wash over the top. These cars require a lot of uh, a lot of downforce at that high speed. So if there's a car in front, it robs a lot of the air from your car. So you tend to get um, a lot of understeer when you're following cars, and uh, and that's why you want to jump out in front of them, even if you have to save fuel. So uh, <clears throat> you you can hold them off pretty easily. That actually answers one of the other questions from Martin, which he was asking about the difference between the aero and the mechanical grip. So obviously these cars are getting more towards aero. Uh, these days, they've got a lot more influence on the aero than the older vehicles used to have. So, um, just while you catch your yeah. breath, there was a, a question from um, <laughs> Ethan who asked about the uh, being the biggest race of the year. Obviously, it's always, regardless of being the last race of this season, it's always the biggest race of the year. And <laughs> it's going. It's very likely that it's going to rain now. Aside from throwing Michael under the bus and putting him in the cast to start when it's likely to be most wet. Uh, how else do you deal with going into a big race like that, knowing that it's going to be a wet race? Uh, a lot of it comes down to getting the right tyre pressures, softening the bars off in the car so that you can get it back if, it's, if it dries out. Um, you don't want to be making too many 
changes from outside the car that you can't change during the race. And like, you know, as I was saying, if it, uh, if it dries out, you want to be able to get that qualifying balance back. How do you do uh, with so mind, you, the you mindset? You do a lot of that. Uh, it's, it's very difficult. You have to, uh, in, in the wet, you're not, you're not, you're searching for grip always. And, um, it takes you a long time to get into the groove because constantly searching where the grip is and it's not on the traditional race line. And that's because, um, you know, in the lead up, especially this weekend, there's been no, no rain. So it's just, there's so much rubber down on the circuit and the rubber becomes very slippery in the wet. So you'll see some pretty funny lines going on um, where people turn in from very late. They'll go quite a high line through the corner um, <clears throat> and then cut back to a very narrow line on exit just to avoid the racing line. So um, <clears throat> you see that a lot around this track, certainly in the previous years. Uh, and once you've, once you've sort of gotten on top of that, you're in the rhythm and you can start pushing quite hard from there. Uh, so I think the best thing to do would be leave whoever is in the car in the car for as long as possible um, <clears throat> while it's raining because, uh, you know, if you swap drivers, then it's going to take that next driver a little while to, you know, get in the groove as well. Yeah, it's a good yeah. point. What about having no fans there at the race this year? It's obviously always packed and uh, such an, uh, the whole atmosphere of that event is <clears throat> about the fans as much as the racing so how does it feel this year without the fans there yeah it's very strange usually you know even through this part of of the pits <clears throat> there'll be just people everywhere and um it's very strange but you know it makes it very easy for us to walk from our trucks um through the cars <clears throat> without getting pulled up and all that sort of stuff which is great you know it's great to have the fan atmosphere i think where you do notice it the most is up over the top, you know, there's no flags, there's no, um, you know, people, you know, no, no birds flashing their tits or anything like that. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's a strange feeling. Actually. I think you notice it most on your outlet when you, you're swerving, warming your tyres and, uh, and you, you look up on the hill and there's just no one up there. So <clears throat> it's... um definitely takes away from the event yeah yeah that kind of leads to the next question which was from Ethan asking about um, as a driver being under the spotlight and having the media and all that sort of stuff keeping uh, you know fairly close eye on you and obviously throwing around rubbish rumors and rubbish stories occasionally and things like that and how do you deal with that as a racing driver is that a difficult part of the your life yeah it, it can be quite difficult um, <clears throat> you know you certainly go to a lot of extent to, to not read comments on what's going on because it's always you know it's it's usually the people that are negative that are going to be the ones commenting um, so yeah it can be it can be difficult and especially if you're having a, a bad run um, you know I had a, a pretty bad run throughout the team 18 days um, even when I was at Erebus they struggled a lot with their cars so you know you uh you, you don't need that extra um, <clears throat> extra pressure or extra weight of, of listening to people, you know, criticise you. So you just got to, it's, it's very hard to do, but you, you've got to really try and ignore it as much as you can and, and try to, um, you know, zone, zone out of that and, and just keep, because you need confidence in this game. If you don't have confidence, um, you know, it can really hurt, can really hurt your run. Uh, you know, you see this year, every qualifying has come down to uh, hunt, some, some qualifiers have come down to hundredths of a second between, um, you know, third and tenth uh, or even, you know, first and fifth. So um, if you just lose that little bit in confidence, it, it, can, it can really hurt you. Uh, so, yeah, very, very difficult thing to do. Um, you got to surround yourself with the right people. And um, sorry, I've got a call, call coming through here, but. So I've lost you guys, but um, if it's your boss, make sure you answer it. <laughs> it is the boss, actually. It's the wife. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm one uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, it, I've been through all that, and I'm sure everyone has. And then you know, I was 
especially when you when you get to uh, to the stage I am in, in my career. Um, if you have a bad result, everyone tells you in uh, or everyone starts questioning you, your age and how long you've been involved. But um, <laughs> it's nice to shut them up when you you know stick it on provisional pole as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah good idea, mate. It's been a pretty good solid season for you here as well. Um, and that sort of does lead to one of the other questions from Scott, who sent in a question asking about your um, when you do finish full time driving, what will you be doing? What's next for Lee Holdsworth? And I mean, I'm, I'll take the answer on this one if you like, because you'll come and work for Evolve Driving, I'm pretty sure, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. I've been there. Be I've been there before, mate. That's true. <laughs> well, mate, yeah. that's, that's where we met, mate. That's where we met back with Dito back in the day. It, it was. That's where we all met. Yeah, yeah, that's where we met. But yeah, I, I, it's it's a hard one. I think you know, we, with our with our career, I think we've got to you got to focus solely on what you're doing. And if you if you're concentrating on something else, um, you know, you're not putting a hundred percent into what we're doing here. So uh, I've got a few ideas. Um, uh, I'd I'd love to stick around the racetrack somewhere i'm sure that uh once once i stop full-time driving i'll be co-driving for quite some years um hopefully some other racing you know just hobby sort of racing um and uh and also you know i'd love to become a one of the ipos which is the investigating prosecutions officer um for for one of the racing categories hopefully supercars where you um you're the, basically the driving standards observer so you you know you you pass on the penalties to drivers. Everyone hates you, but um, it's a, it's a pretty cool job. You, you really need an ex driver in that in that position so that they understand, you know, uh, whether it was intentional or unintentional, or uh, and and what penalty to apply. So yeah, there's but there's a few other things. You know, my, my I've got the bit of my brother's business is running up there in um, Brisbane, uh, or Gold Coast. And um, I'd love to expand to uh, to Melbourne with that stuff, but yeah, that's um, that's something to think about. Hopefully, in uh, a fair few more years. Yeah, definitely a few years, and that is uh, leading to the next question: of Do you have any bucket list tracks, events, or cars that you want to drive? Yeah. I've always wanted to do Spa, um, the Spa Twenty Four Hour. I think um, you know, in an Audi, uh, the the same sort of Audi that I drive in the. I've just been doing some uh, coaching for someone who's at uh, oh, yeah. at the moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's one of the most unbelievable tracks in the world. I uh, probably, I think it, it's up there with Bathurst from from the sounds of it. So, um, you know, the the GT race there would just be amazing. Um, not sure what else. I, I'd just love to do some GT stuff overseas. Mate, I've got a very special free flight Commodore here. for you to drive. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's been a few years since I've driven that one, George. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry, mate. He's getting ready for you. <laughs> it's been a few years since George has driven it too. <laughs> exactly <laughs> hey, right. Uh, exactly right. <laughs> hey guys, I, I need to wrap it up in a minute because I, I have to go. But um, yeah, if you've got another question for me, we can finish off with one. Yeah, the Audi driver. Um, just a quick one on um, what cars do you own personally? But that's probably a null and void question. As a racing driver, you don't own any cars. You just get them off everyone else, don't you? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> I'll buy a car when I'll buy a car when I don't get given one. I don't have a car uh, at home. Oh, well, uh, we we own Alana's car, and that's a Range Rover Evoque. But um, yeah, I, I just drive around in the Ford Raptor. And, uh, and once that's up, I'll, I'll get myself some kind of hoon machine. I've always loved yeah. the VK, VK Brock Commodore. Um, Good I boy. I can't say that too loud because um, I can afford. But uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Hey, folks, just before Lee's got to get going, is there any other questions that you would like us that we haven't already touched on or that he hasn't already covered? No, just thank you for your time. Yeah. No, no. We we'll appreciate Thank it. Yeah. And Lee. Could... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, guys. No, no, you're good. All I was going to say, mate, is I've got over here, I don't know whether you can see it, but I've got a toast to the mountain for you for tomorrow, an offering. Oh, I see you now. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and, it's the, it's, and it's the good stuff, mate. Oh. Okay? It's the good <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Yes, the last time, mate, the last time you were on the podium there was with Caruso, and I reckon this year, 
it's it's deemed to happen again, buddy. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, good, mate. Good, good luck. luck. Good luck. Thank you, mate. Good luck, mate. Thank you. Luck, mate. Yes, Thank guys, you. Mate. Thanks for Thanks, Dean. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, guys. Right. Before everyone else goes, I'll, uh, I can chat to everyone else, but Lee's got to shoot through. Thanks so much, Lee, for uh, getting on board and doing this and uh, inviting us along. It's been fantastic. Good luck tomorrow. Really yeah, uh, exactly. hope you get a good result. And just get that Thanks, mate. for me, can you? Can you get that autograph from uh, TD for me? Oh, yeah, yeah. No worries. I'll see, but he's a hard man to get because he's always very busy with the fans <laughs> <laughs> well there's only four thousand right. of them then this year <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're all lining up for td's autograph all right i'll, Thanks, I'll catch you later guys cheers, good good Thank you. cheers guys Bye. so everyone else thanks for joining us today that was really good and um i hope you enjoyed what lee had to offer there it was a bit difficult having to look at the car through the phone with some of the uh, angles and things the light wasn't great but it was uh, he, he tried his hardest to give you a great experience considering the circumstances with COVID and everything like that so hopefully it was a little bit more of a chance to still be involved in Bathurst even though we're stuck at home how are we all traveling uh, brilliant brilliant yeah, that was great thank you yeah thank, thank you Dan. Awesome. Thanks, thanks, Dean. It was great. And just uh, would like to point out, George down there, if you can all see George on the screen as well, it was uh, through his connection, his uh, personal sponsor through his business there, the Big Picture People, a personal sponsor of Lee, has been for a long time, as we mentioned there in the discussion. Um, and uh, it's really good to be able to connect these things together and, and open that out to get you guys involved as well. Um, so just remember that name, Big Picture People, if you're looking at home theatres and all that sort of stuff. There's no other place Thanks. to go. So Thanks. there you go. Thanks, mate.